and then um, uh, spend five minutes to respond to the other, and then we will open it up to questions uh, from from all of you, maybe some from me, um, and uh, we'll see where the where we go. I knowing knowing these two gentlemen, uh, I'm quite sure this generate this debate will generate at least as much light as he. So let me turn the floor over now to William. You going first? Yeah. William Thomas. about why um, I think we need a government and why anarchy is an empty rationalization and kind of a religion of the libertarians. <laughs> and I'm going to have to move fast, so I'm going to talk about first objectivist objections to anarchism, and then I want to talk about practice, like in reality. Uh, what is anarchy, really? People say anarchy is. Uh, I'd like to talk about what I think we can say from reality about what anarchy is, and some examples. And uh, just to conclude with some uh, with a thought. So what are we all looking for from a political system? What are we all looking for? We're looking for a system that protects our individual rights, or you know, if you want to just boil it right down, that bans the initiation of physical force between people where you can live in society and expect that generally the expectation of your interactions with other people will be that they will be conditioned by the understanding that no one should be initiating the use of force against someone else. And you hope that if someone does initiate force against you, either you're able to deal with it easily yourself or a lot of friends will help you and that um, when uh, people use force, they're always uh, defending against the initiation of force. And so the implications of this in rights theory are rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, and uh, many other subsidiary rights. And this is all premised on the right to act as a living being free from the initiation of force. And that's why, why have that at all? Why? Because force is inimical to reason. You can't live a productive and happy life if you're not able to pursue your values and act on your judgment. You can't even think well if you're not allowed to uh, uh, act on your judgment. Government. Uh, this my writ is to defend government. So let me define my terms right away. What is a government? People often say government is a monopoly on the use of force. I think that's a little sloppy. Um, after all, to say it's a legal monopoly is an oxymoron. Um, but we're talking about force. So um, you know, when there's a, an economic monopoly, it means they're going to use force against you if you violate the terms of the monopoly, like if you compete with it. Um, but, uh, you know, anyone who sets some standards about the use of force is going to use force against you if you violate those standards with force. I mean, so to say that the government is a coercive monopoly is just to say it's a government. And it's just to say it's in the business of enforcing uh, social rules uh, and enforcing them coercively. Um, and even anarchists believe in such institutions. Uh, that is, the institutions that enforce social rules and do that coercively. Now, a government is an institution that enforces social rules in a given geographic area, and it enforces them coercively. And what distinguishes the government from all the different organizations, like uh, the mafia, or uh, uh, maybe um, some of you all here in New Hampshire who don't like what the government does, a lot of us who don't like it, and maybe rebel a little bit, or violate its rules, is that it can't be challenged with impunity. The, there are gangs who violate the rules, uh, violate the rules of the government consistently. Uh, they do, but they can't get too big. They can't get too aggressive, or the government will stomp on them. Uh, so you can't challenge it with impunity. If you can challenge it, but you can't challenge it and just ignore it. Um, and so. With this definition of government, what I mean by a government, let's be clear, it's not someone who claims mystic authority to rule over you. That's not in the definition. 
a government is just this, this kind of institution, and a government could have separated powers. We live under one that's like that. It could have different levels. We live under one that's like that. It could have competing institutions. We actually, in some respects, are under one that does that. And uh, this is, but a government is the framework in which these all interact and cooperate non-violently, and uh, that it's this framework that can't be challenged with impunity. Why do we need government? Well, government is the means of placing the use of retaliatory uh, force under objective control. It does this through the creation of law, through the creation of the rule of law. And I can't dilate on all the characteristics of the rule of law, but let's just say um, it's, uh, it, it tries to be applied objectively, consistently. Um, uh, the rule of law is um, not personal. Um, it's principled. Uh, and many other characteristics. The rule of law is essential to industry, to trade, and to liberty. Uh, contracts depend on it. Uh, the ability to do any kind of trading over long distances depends on consistency of rule of law. And, uh, and I just want to emphasize that any institutional framework that adequately enforces a unified, consistent law, I would call a government, Now, market anarchism, just to, to be clear what I'm talking against, uh, market anarchism, as I understand the, the, the argument, holds that there should be no unified legal defense or law enforcement mechanism, that there should be competition in the use of force, um, and there should be no state. There's the thing called the state. It won't be there. Uh, the, and then the idea is that law and law enforcement will be provided by a variety of competing agencies, and they will geographically overlap, too. That's the idea. And the analogy in a lot of these discussions is to the market provision of other goods. We like free market exchange of other goods because we engage in trade. We judge when we want to buy a good or not, when we want to contract with someone or not. And so all our interactions can be win-win. They can all be uh, scaled to our benefit by our judgment and that we would like to have the provision of law to work that way too, if we could. That would be great. Um, but the thing is that um, to say, to speak of a market for coercion is kind of a misnomer, because coercion is not like other goods. The use of force is not like other goods. Because a free market, a real free market, is uncoerced. One of the basic rules of the free market is that it's uncoerced, that your rights are respected. Um, and when we speak of trade, what we mean is voluntary exchange to mutual benefit. But if what we're doing is uh, negotiating with a variety of people with guns, using our guns, about how those guns are going to be employed, the discussion doesn't presume that no one is going to be coerced. Actually, if we don't come to an agreement, it presumes that someone will be coerced. That's not the um, uh, that's not the way it works at the supermarket, right? At the supermarket, it's not the case that if you just decide you don't want to shop there, they're going to stuff the food down your throat no matter what, right? <laughs> you know, you've got to make a choice of who's going to stuff the food down your throat. Another basic point about anarchism that's worth remembering is that um, a standard argument, um, like Roy Childs wrote an, uh, an open letter to Ayn Rand in the late 1960s, saying this, saying, all people are rational. You say people can be rational. And if they're rational, they'll just recognize what other people's rights are. So we don't need any government because we can just uh, recognize what other people's, what other people's rights are. Uh, and Rand actually represented something like this in Galt's Gulch in Atlas Shrugged. Uh, and so that's it. But the truth is that irrational and evil people exist. Rationality is not automatic. Rationality is a virtue, and it's a virtue for a reason. It's that we don't do it automatically. We don't do it well, and lots of people choose not to do it well. And they're not going to respect rights necessarily because they're irrational and evil. Uh, ISIS, for instance, not on the uh, respect your rights premise in any sense. 
And the other thing is, even with the best will in the world and really decent people with the right principles and all that, there are honest disagreements. Knowledge is contextual, and there are disputes over rights. Heated disputes that you screwed me, and that contract was violated, and you're an asshole, and that huge corporation are horrible exploiters, you know? And there are a lot of reasons why libertarian defense alliances would have honest disagreements about issues of rights and their application that uh, they, um, that they uh, uh, would care about, you know, that are very important to a lot of people, like abortion. Uh, lots of people think abortion is a hugely important matter if they could get their own uh, little mini-government that would enforce abortion their way. But we're talking about mixed up governments together. Um, that's not going to be happy. Let me just wrap up here with just uh, a, mo a statement about some examples. So Rand gives some examples of uh, uh, anarchy, like uh, the gang warfare amongst uh, uh, urban gangs. Or, um, the, you know, the, uh, uh, or the airways before property rights were defined in them. There was uh, people uh, sending radio overlapping each other's signals, not respecting each other's territories. In the world today, we've got anarchic areas like the Middle East, uh, Syria and Libya. There have been anarchic areas. What I want to say to you is the world today is the result of the competition and the use of force. It's the result. We're seeing the competition, the use of force, and its effects all around us. Check out the Hundred Years' War, nice example. World War is a good example of competition over government. Um, you're going to have to assess the existence and possibility of anarchy across the whole spectrum of human existence. Don't cherry pick. And think about industrial society. If you wanted to, to move, what if you wanted to move there, invest there, invent there, speak out there? Today, people from Ghana and other places are migrating through anarchy because there's anarchy in Libya. There's anarchy in Libya. There's no government. It's, you're able to contract for somebody to do things that would otherwise be illegal. It's not a problem. Uh, they can take you uh, all the way from Ghana to uh, wherever you want to go. Where do they want to go? Italy. Why do they want to go to Italy? Because they have the rule of law there. They don't want to stay in the anarchy and invest there. Why not? It's an anarchy. A fair number of Ghanans are dying on this trip. You're being killed in the anarchy. They like Italy better. They're much, like, much more, less likely to be killed there. So that's my little statement about anarchy. Uh, not, it's a rationalism. Uh, when it does exist, it's bad, we need rule of law, and if we ever had it, and if the market anarchist theories worked, they would work by creating a government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Will you just give me a warning? Yeah, I'll give you one minute more. Test, test. Um, that was a nice presentation, I think, of the objectivist position. Uh, and as as Will's, uh, the tenor of his talk kind of indicated, the question when he talked about whether government is justified or not, uh, the question is not really whether anarchism is something we should be for or against any more than objectivists say they're for atheism, right? Objectivists are for reason, and they, they therefore don't believe there's a basis for believing in God. That makes them atheists, but they're not for atheism. So it's not like we're for anarchism. The question is, um, uh, should we be for or against the state, okay? And also, I don't even, I think we have to be leery of the word government, right? The word government, sometimes it's used as a synonym for state, sometimes it's not. In parliamentary systems, they talk about forming a new government. They obviously don't mean the state. In the U.S., when there's a government shutdown, the state is still there. So government and state are different entities, as Will almost uh, admitted, I think, in his talks, when he says that any institution that enforces laws in some kind of reliable way is a government. So that doesn't get at the essential characteristics of what the state is. Okay? There's a, there are other words we have to be careful with. The word coercion, libertarians sometimes use the word coercion as a synonym for aggression. It's not, nor is violence or force. Right? Aggression is a very uh, carefully defined uh, concept uh, in libertarian theory. Okay? And sometimes the pro-state, minarchist, objectivists, if you admit that you're in favor of law and order, then they say that you believe in government because they define it that way. 
And then later on you say I'm against the state, and they say, but the government is the state, because they believe it's necessary. So it's either a form of question begging or some kind of equivocation. So to my mind, let's just talk about the state. Is the state justified or not? For my mind, the question is not whether we need state. It's not whether the state is necessary or even inevitable or unlikely. The simple question for libertarians is whether the state is just. Okay, and not just any state, not like the American state today, not like the Iraqi state, but the state per se by its nature. So we need a couple of definitions. What is the state? Okay, so I think a good way to define the state is it's a territorial monopolist of ultimate decision making. It's an institution vested with the power to legislate and tax the inhabitants of the territory. Now that's not part of the definition, that's just what they tend to do. I'm going to just quote Hans Hermann Hoppe here. Let me begin with the definition of a state. What must an agent be able to do to qualify as a state? This agent must be able to insist that all conflicts among the inhabitants of a given territory be brought to him for ultimate decision making or be subject to his final review. In particular, this agent must be able to insist that all conflicts involving himself be adjudicated by himself and his agent and implied in the power to exclude all others from acting as the ultimate judge. The second defining characteristic of a state is the power to tax, to unilaterally determine the price that justice seekers must pay for these services. So based on this definition, it's easy to see why there might be a desire to be a state or to have control of a state. Whoever is the monopolist of final arbitration in a given territory can make laws, and he who can legislate can also tax, which is an enviable position. Okay, so in my view, the state is basically an exploiting firm, but its definition is a territorial monopolist over justice and law in a given geographic region. Okay. Now, the question is, what is justice? Because we said, is the state just? Justinian, emperor of Rome, said justice is the constant and perpetual wish to render to everyone his due. In other words, it's, to what, it's what you're owed. Now, what you're owed depends upon what your rights are. What your rights are, according to libertarianism, which I think we all agree on, is to be free from aggression. So it's, it's, it's very simple. Ayn Rand said, so long as men desire to live together, no man may initiate. Do you hear me? No man may start the use of physical force against others. I agree with this, and I agree with Will's basic justification uh, for this principle. So the question is simply, is the state just according to what its essential nature is? Does the state necessarily, by its nature, violate rights? In other words, does the state necessarily commit aggression? This is the only question that matters to libertarians. Okay? Now, in my view, the state has to do one of two things to be a state. It has to either tax or it has to monopolize uh, justice services in a given area. Either one is actually sufficient and in implies the other. So, for example, if you only had the power to tax, then you could easily outcompete any competing firm because you could offer, uh, you, you know, you're, it's just like the public school would outcompete private schools because you're paying the taxes already for the public schools. On the other hand, if the state didn't tax but it had the, uh, the power to exclude uh, any competition, then it could just charge a monopoly price for its services, which is equivalent to a tax. Now, the objectivists, I believe, according to Rand, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure our friends here, rightfully, rightly reject the power of the state to tax. But as far as I understand it, they still believe the state has the power and the right to outlaw comp competing agencies in a given geographic region, um, which is a form of aggression. Because if you actually use force to stop someone from engaging in a peaceful activity, when they haven't committed the aggression themselves, you're committing aggression yourself. Um, now, it's possible that my friends here are really anarchists and just don't like the word. <laughs> Galt's Gulch looks a little anarchistic to me. Um, okay. Now, in practice, all states engage in both taxation and legislation, um, and the state is really an exploiting firm. How much time do I have? Uh, four minutes. Okay. Let me just summarize here. As, in as, as a matter of practice, here's what the state really does in real life, the state we're dealing with now that all states have always done, especially in modern states, especially in the West. Um, so first of all, well, the goal of the state is to maximize its wealth by exploiting its victims. Now, the state is always a minority. That's the only way you know, someone at the top of the pyramid can make a lot of money in a classic firm situation. So the state is a minority, so they can be overpowered by the masses. So they have a problem. They want to exploit these people, but they're, they're a minority. So they have to come up with ways to keep the population at bay, to delude them into thinking the state is legitimate, which is what distinguishes it from the mafia. Uh, people don't largely regard the mafia as legitimate, although the mafia taxes you less and provides better services. <laughs> okay. so, 
the first thing the state does is it engages in ideological propaganda to persuade us that the world is not really the way it is, that taxes really are voluntary, that we would have chaos in the streets without the state, etc. Okay? And then it engages in a variety of targeted redistribution measures to corrupt the people uh, that it wants to redistribute money from. So first it monopolizes the courts, the law, the police, the feds, the judicial system. Then it starts monopolizing traffic and communication, right? Because it can't go around robbing people without control of the rivers and the internet. Uh, it also monopolizes the field of education, which ties back into its ideological propaganda role. Then the state redistributes power itself in the form of democracy. It opens it up. It tells us you are the government. Don't complain when your brother-in-law is thrown in jail for, uh, for marijuana uh, distribution. Okay. And finally, the final step is it monopolizes the field of money and banking because even – even the state has trouble taking out loans to fund its activities or taxing people because it's going to get resistance. So it's far better to just take over the federal the, – the, the banking and monetary system so that it can just print money to pay for its, uh, for its activities. So by my mind, the state is unjust and legitimate because it necessarily commits aggression, and indeed it's just a criminal agency of aggression. It can be defined that way as well. Um, I would just add one more thing. The state is the institutionalized agency of aggression. It commits what you can call public aggression. Libertarians are against all aggression, including private aggression, which is crime. So we're against private crime and state crime. It's just that, it's just that the state is a much more successful criminal than the private uh, underground. Thank you. All right, I, I hear... Um, Applause from uh, more than one species. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we now move to the um, uh, rebuttal phase. Will, you have five minutes to uh, follow up. Well, um, I thought we were going to debate anarchism. And all I've, heard are, all I've heard is a rationalist critique of a vision of what government is. That's it. That hasn't been a positive view for anarchism at all. It hasn't addressed the fact that when anarchists talk of a system of law that is somehow not a, um, uh, a unified, a cooperative system that enforces social rules coercively in a geographic area and can't be resisted with impunity, if it's not that, they say it's not that because there's free competition amongst the agencies. But that's the existence of such a thing. The possibility of such a thing is exactly the issue here, at least I thought. Um, now, uh, Stefan said a lot of nasty things about uh, government. So Stefan says the state, um, at least in his essential definition, that's the same definition. I mean, it's more or less the same definition I gave for government. So the points about how the language is used, that's fine. Uh, we can say we'll talk about the state. I don't want the definition of the state. Uh, I'll take that. Right? That's, that's, that's semantics. I don't think. Okay. Um, let me uh, get uh, on to. Um, <coughs> uh, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to go back and um, talk a little bit about why I think. Um, uh, the nub of the issue, uh, one of the nubs of the issue that Stefan got at was he thinks um, the state is illegitimate because it won't leave other people free to, um, uh, co uh, to compete with the state. That they won't do that. Um, and I've always been puzzled by this because as far as I understood the market anarchist argument was that they were supposed to be, you were supposed to maybe form or there were going to be various defense agencies. We're going to have no government to start with and we're going to have a bunch of defense agencies, right? Uh, but the defense agencies are all going to have to have their own conception of law. Um, I mean, the rights as we understand them are so abstract. I, I had a slide, maybe you didn't have a chance to read it, but there's lots of definition issues in how the rights come down in practice. Um, and those all have to be worked out. Um, and after all, even in the best society I can imagine, there might be a significant minority who really don't agree with all those principles. So they may be trying to form a different kind of uh, defense agency. 
Now, but if that happens and I join a defense agency, or me and Stefan, we agree about the fundamental purpose, so we're both out shopping for you know, a defense agency, or maybe we're going to have to form one because in our neighborhood you know, there's no friendly Walmart delivering good <laughs> defense agency services to us right now. So we say, all right, we're going to have a, our law is going to be based in the uh, uh, protection of individual rights. Uh, we're going to ban the initiation of force or aggression, if you want to put it that way. Um, but that's the whole discussion. Um, the, and we're going to do that. Now, there's one thing we want in our dealings with other people. We want our rights respected. So we're going to go around to all the other people forming defense agencies and we're going to say, you do whatever you want. You get whatever customers you want. It's just one thing. we got to be real sure you're not going to violate our rights. Because, you know, we don't want you ending up being taken over by ISIS or, you know, the uh, Christian right and, uh, or the Greens and uh, shoving it all down our throats. Or just being a thug or a liar. They're libertarian thugs and liars. They sound good. Uh, in abstract, but in concrete, they are power seekers and frauds. It happens. So we want to be sure that our rights are going to be respected. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to form cooperative, cooperative, cooperative agreements with other defense agencies where we can count on them, you know, where we know we can count on them, and they follow the right principles. We're going to have to check every defense agency that could be really dangerous to us, that could resist us with impunity, to make sure it observes the right principles. And if they do, they're okay. What have we done once we've done that? We've created the state. We have created a unified system of enforcing uh, social rules coercively in a geographic area. We're gonna have to do it to defend our rights. It's gonna have to be that way. Uh, and that's because coercion is different. Um, uh, Stephen makes a lot about tax, whatever. You know, uh, one of my principles is um, it's early days. Maybe when we get a lot closer to a free society, the institutional possibilities are going to be a lot clearer to us. But all we know right now is that um, if what you're doing is defining the law, even if you're a defense agency, you're still offering to shoot people that don't follow your principles. That's not really voluntary. So to make a lot of noise about tax, I mean, uh, yes, we'd like to have fee-for-service as much as we can. Rand has some interesting ideas about that. Other people have too. But um, uh, uh, the point is, even in those circumstances, I mean, one of Rand's examples was only charge people who need to engage in long-term contracts. They get the most economic value out of the state, so only charge them. And they don't have to do a formal contract, so you know, you're not really interfering with a lot of their choices. But the truth is, you need the institution of long-term contracts. You can't flourish as fully as possible without it. Um, and they're forcing you to pay for it. Um, and I think all these fee-for-service examples for government services end up working like that. So it's a good idea to make fee-for-service, but it's still not going to be that different from a tax. Those are my remarks. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Will. I'll just comment on a few of uh, Will's remarks, mostly his, his initial uh, talk. but. Uh, I thought it was interesting you mentioned Ayn Rand had brought up the problem of coming up with a proprietarian or property rights solution to the airwaves problem, which David Kelly has written probably the best single book on that with Roger Donnelly, right? Laissez parleur, right? The only book I know of that is consistent and deals with this problem in the right way. But as you point out, the U.S. government <laughs> actually monopolized by statute with the FCC, the airwaves, and so in this case, the government actually prevented a free market solution from arising, a common law type solution. So that's not a very good example. The one problem I have with, uh, with this view of, of the, the problem of competing defense agencies that object to the C is that I have never heard a good explanation of why this doesn't imply the need for a one world government. Some, some I've talked to have kind of admitted that, but they say that it's too early or that the other governments are so irrational that if we had a one-world government right now, we'd be a minority in the sea of irrationality. But it looks like their long-term ideal goal would be a one-world government. Now, I, I don't think I need to explain here the danger of that horrible thing, which means that I would think even a rational objectivist would say we need to have some distributed power, some competing states around the world. But if that's possible, I don't know where the limit is. Even Mises thought you could push it down to a very, very tiny level. I don't know how far the objectivistic you could have a state. Um, so that's one point. 
Um, I think Will is referring to my position as rationalist, although basically my position is very simple. I agree with him that aggression is unjust. I don't think that's a rationalist thing to say. And we roughly agree on the redefinition of the state, so I don't know where the rationalism is there. I'm just simply asking the question or making the observation that we cannot support the state's legitimacy if it commits aggression. It's very simple. I don't think that's rationalist either. Um, so uh, the other one, uh, he made the point that it looks like some libertarians uh, have, like Roy Childs he mentioned, had implied that the state, is the state is not justified because everyone's rational and the free market will work out without the state. Uh, I don't think libertarians assume everyone is rational in the, in the objectivist sense. Uh, in fact, our recognition that a lot of people are not rational and are evil is the reason we fear the state because as Hayek talks about, you know, the worst rise to the top. So if some people are bad, don't give them the power of nuclear weapons. Um, Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, so, we're going to open this up to questions, but first I want to ask uh, one question of, of each of our participants. So, uh, let me start with Will. Um, would you um, care to comment on the point about world government? Does the logic of the objectivist position push us toward the idea, uh, toward thinking that the best um, uh, government would be a world government? Um, I think that's actually an open and ongoing question that and if, if you could have, I mean, whatever, when we're talking about if we could have one good unified system of government, it would be very minimal, very rights respecting. So um, it would be, it would have a lot of checks and balances. No, no. I, you see, when I talk about my ideal government, I think I'm talking about what would really happen if you succeeded in trying to engage in libertarian anarchism, if you succeeded in it. Um, so that's one issue. But the, the thing is, the, the problem with the libertarian project, uh, the libertarian anarchist project, is that it envisions a, a set of competition over government services that happens uh, on, on over... Uh, every transaction and every pairwise combination that might happen. Whereas um, when you have geographically uh, centered governments, then at least their competition can be brought under, sort of managed a little better, because the number of transactions that have to cross the government to government barrier is, much, is smaller by, well, probably a factor of a million. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't do the pairwise to pairwise versus group to group math straight off my head, but it's, it's, it's much, much, much smaller. Um, and we live in such a world where that happens, and when the competition gets um, strong, it's bad. You know, it's bad. World War II, uh, what's going on in the Middle East, it's bad. Um, so we, uh, wouldn't, we'd like to move to a much freer society. I guess that's the one thing I want to say. I want to say that this the one thing I do want to just remark while I'm abusing the microphone for a second is that this is an interesting this theoretical discussion. I think there's, a, there's a, a, a truth here, but the bigger truth is we need a society with much, much, much more freedom. That's the actionable item for us. That's what we're, you know, we should dedicate ourselves to trying to achieve. And when we can perfect it uh, at the, you know, far down the road, that's going to be a richer conversation once we know what that's like. Uh, Stefan, my question for you. <clears throat> As I understand it, um, the uh, market anarchism um, uh, vision is that there will be competing protection agencies uh, of some kind. And the expectation uh, is that they will compete, as firms do in a private market, uh, without initiating aggression against each other. Um, one of the worries that, that Will raised on his side was, well, there are all kinds of people. If, co if coercion is the good that's being marketed, um, some people may market a little more use of coercion than, than others. And, um, so we have uh, the possibility of, of agencies uh, who that are not rights respecting. 
Now, again, if I understand the position, um, the expectation is, well, it, what we know about economics is that's not going to happen. Uh, let me, so here's my question for you. Um, you start a protection agency with Will and um, go into business, and then this other protection agency, the state of New Hampshire, say, or the U.S. government, um, says, no, we're, we're not going to allow you to be in business. We're going to take over. Um, we're going to coerce you out of business. Well, okay, so that's a big, that's a big protection agency. Um, it's pushing you out of the way. Why you could, in a certain sense, we're in a situation where you could, um, anyone could start a protection agency. Why is the, the yeah, well, why is the situation <laughs> different um, now from what you envision, and how would you get there? Oh, that's not a big question, is it? <laughs> <laughs> One quick quip in response to the world government thing. Uh, if it does go bad, now we can vote with our feet by going to another country or another state. I guess in this one world government situation, we can vote with our spaceships. That'll be our only, our only choice. Um, as to the economic point, um, well, of course, public choice economics has similar criticisms of the mechanism of any state, right? You're going to have institutional problems with expecting any state to not abuse its power, not be corrupt, uh, to not be inefficient. Um, but I think even the, the objectivist or the minarchist vision is that we can only achieve a free society, whether it's a, a limited state or, or, uh, or anarchy, with some kind of overall enlightenment of humanity, right? We, it's just not going to happen otherwise, right? You have to have a certain increase in people's education and awareness and values. We already have a degree of society now because people are by and large decent. Crime is regarded as crime. Criminals are regarded as criminals. They're ostracized, they're usually poor, they're stupider, so we can keep an eye on them, we can survive even in the, fact, in the, in the face of, of crime. Um, if we ever achieve a minarchist state, then the human condition is going to have improved a lot. Our wealth is going to be greater, we're going to be more educated, more intelligent. In such a world, I don't think it's quite as outlandish to also believe that uh, these competing agencies would work because you would have mostly peaceful people hiring mostly peaceful agencies and on occasion, if one cropped up like you're talking about, I think they would be just regard, be regarded as a species of crime. It would maybe be organized crime instead of being a random criminal. And they would be dealt with like all criminals are dealt with. And there's a lot of literature on um, why the use of actual violence to solve disputes, even in legitimate disputes, is just way too costly. So I actually believe, like Randy Burnett talks about this in his book, The Structure of Liberty, uh, even if there's a right to retaliate proportionally, to have punishment. Um, I think we can expect that to be far minimized and hardly ever institutionalized in any kind of society. I think ostracism and just market forces would, would do the trick there. So that'd be my response. Okay. Um. <laughs> All right, let's, let's open this up to questions from uh, any of you now. Please come forward to the mics on either side. things I felt was missing was the definition of anarchy. Uh, the, anarchy the anarchy that was talked about here, uh, gang wars and the mafia, that's not, I'm going to go from the original Greek, uh, and meant without, archon meant without <laughs> rulers. So that meant without rulers, not rules, but without rulers. I want to make a few points. Uh, government and state are legal fictions. They can't be felt, seen, heard, or smelled. Only the men and women who work for the legal fictions are real. So that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with men and women. Uh, libertarians don't enforce rules coercively, that is, by the use of physical force. Uh, the supermarket was used for an analogy, and it was a poor analogy because when you go to the supermarket, there are no guns there. It's all voluntary. Um, I'll make those points if you want to talk to them, at least so that the audience Okay. Who is your, do you want each of us to take? I, I, yeah, let me give a brief answer. Definition then you of can, anarchy? Yeah, or, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Stefan, you're, you're defending anarchy. Why don't you yeah. define it? Uh, there are different types of anarchism. Uh, people call anarcho-syndicalism, uh, anarcho-capitalism. I was careful to try to say at, at, near the end of my remarks that 
what libertarians oppose is aggression. That is aggression committed by the state, but also private aggression or private crime, which implies that we respect property rights. Okay, so that implies what is called anarcho-capitalism usually, or what I usually refer to as anarcho-libertarianism. So to my mind, anarcho-capitalism is simply a world where there is very little crime and property rights are widely respected. And there's, there's no institutionalized crime, that is, there's no state, and there's very little private crime. Right. Uh, uh, sorry, the, on the, the definition, so the definition we were all using, I was using, I, I thought I, I hoped I was clear, I mean, it was an idea that there would be no such thing as government, as I called it, but I accept we could call it state, and what Stephen is saying, it would be a situation, anarchy itself is, there is no state. Yeah, except right. the... Would you define you gang wars and mafia? Uh, yes, sir, excuse me, I'm, we have quite a few people in line here now. Let me answer about the gang oh. wars. Oh. I, I'm okay. sorry if my, uh, unclear, those were examples of, those are examples of anarchies. They are not uh, the definition. The definition is any social circumstance in which there's no such institution as a state yeah. or government, as Stefan and I both defined it. And those were examples of situations uh, like the uh, where there's no either no government influence or there's government that uh, isn't involved in the conversation. Like when the Crips and the Bloods go at it, no one's calling the popo. You know, no one's appealing to the police to resolve it. Yeah, I, I think most people believe that without a state, you would have chaos. So they equate anarchy with chaos. But anarcho-capitalists don't believe there would be chaos without a state. Not necessarily. Right. I'm not defining it as chaos. It's yes, sir. I know. I know you're not. Um, okay, we'll alternate um, this side. Um, if, if I could ask, um, we're eager for questions and comments, but if you could keep them as brief as possible to um, tap into the... Um, the uh, knowledge and expertise of the speakers. Thank you. Is there a practical approach or time to with respect to this kind of anarchical capitalism or anything else? I mean, what would be the real next steps that could possibly take place? I, didn't, I, I think didn't, that's a question. I didn't yeah. understand. I didn't hear that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, what, what would be a practical step to moving towards anarchy or an anarcho capitalism? I mean, what would actually, you know, is it is it waiting for everything to collapse before it starts over again? Or is there some kind of, in the next 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, 10 years. Uh, Is there a I got it. Yeah. I mean, that's another huge question. I'll just give three kind of short answers to think about. Um, uh, after communism fell in the Soviet Union, it was a big teaching moment. More people today, far more people, are aware that you need a free market and that so centralized planning is bad. It was a big educational moment. More people, millions of people have been educated by that event than you know Milton Friedman ever could have with a few <laughs> books. Unfortunately. So my hope is that as progress, as technology progresses and we become wealthier despite the state's depredations, that over time people, and I think crime falls as wealth goes up, people will naturally become more aware of the benefits of freedom. So that's one hope. I don't believe that the phoenix rising from the ashes idea is going to work. That would be horrible. Uh, but the, I'll just end on this. In, in, I was in uh, with Hans Hermann Hoppe one time. and. You know, he made the suggestion that we, he needed to get a comedian for the Property and Freedom Society because really laughing at the state is one of the best things we can do. <laughs> Treat the state like a joke. <laughs> Don't take them seriously. Don't give them respect. So laugh at the state would be my practical solution for now. Okay, yes. Yeah, I'll try to get it clear. For Will, never mind jumping in and first. If I have TV and, I'm, and I close the camera, sir, close circuit, uh, I, I see someone on my uh, security system stole my TV yesterday, brought it to his house next door, right? Do I still have a right to that TV in his house? So that, follow, I'm assuming yes. yes. Do I have a right to get that TV back? Yes. Do I have a right to transfer that right to get that TV back? My friend yes. Is, <laughs> but, okay, so however, the, however, the, you're in another house. A guy shows up, says, I, well, I am reclaiming my property. Okay. I'm taking it. The neighbors all wonder, what the hell is going on? Uh, is this person a criminal, or are they being just? Uh-oh, we need a process. I mean, I'm answering you. We need a process to determine if this really was a rights violation or not. That's why we need law. That's why we need to put it under objective control. So that's... But I do have a right to transfer my right to retrieve my TV. Whether I give him a dollar, you give me a dollar for that transfer. I you know. have the right. I have the need to know that what's being transferred is a right, and what you are not are criminals. Why do you, why do you, 
Why? Do, no, I'm, if I'm involved at all. I mean, what's well, not involved at all? No one involved with me and my goddamn TV. It, and whoever you're taking it from. Okay, so you're, you're, you're no taking it from. Wait, no, he's not involved. Let's bring this down a little bit. Um, <laughs> at, <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, All right, Will, if you could clarify the question okay. calmly. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm excitable about these ideas. Here's the question. Passion. No, no, passion. That's a good thing. Passion. Try to combine all passion and reason. Hopefully, combine them. <clears throat> um, anyway, um, so the question essentially was that if, if individuals have rights to their own things, and they have the right to respond to the initiation of force against them, and they have the right to cooperate voluntarily with anyone in the protection of their rights, which they, yeah, yes, that is an invitation of individual rights, then what the hell is the state for? I mean, I think that was the question. Um, and my answer was that um, in the example, one person was deciding, was declaring that their rights, and in fact, it was true that their rights had been violated and their TV was now in the house of another person, and they proposed to invade the property of the other person and take the TV. The other person is a person with rights. The other person may disagree about the situation. Often, these things happen. Or that other person may be a liar. But the thing is, that person may disagree. If, in general, we're going to want a system where if anyone aggresses against us, uh, we can show objectively what the case is. Uh, if anyone else became concerned with the issue, uh, they would want to know uh, what the, the objective case of the si situation is, and that's what we need law for. Okay. Thank you, Will. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, there, there's something, this is for you, Will, but, um, there's something you said uh, that caught my attention, that you, you talked about having defense agencies, you know, a reasonable right to transfer, you know, to, and competing defense agencies. Um, but then you see there was a sort of, you said, um, there's this one thing. There's this one thing you have, you, of the different defense agencies. You can't, uh, you have to respect our right. But actually, is that really true? And as long as the other defense, ISIS defense agencies, as long as they don't actually initiate anything against you, right? Actually, I mean, yes, you may be in a state of war with them, it may be morally acceptable to, to go fight with the thumb, for instance, or test your weapons or something, right? if they are openly, openly in conflict with you. But actually, it's not, it's not necessary to back into a state from that point. It's not necessary to say, we must, we must all, one by one, go around all the different defense agencies, even ones thousands of miles away, and make them follow our model. That just, that just doesn't seem to be true at all. Um, the, the competing defense agency idea is that there are going to be a lot of overlapping defense agencies. They're not far away. They're all here. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the, the default position in the, in the anarchist, the libertarian anarchist argument is that so, there won't be such a thing as the state, and then any people can form any coalitions they want. And in, I'll bet you, even in the best society, 10 to 20 percent are going to be heavily committed to some practical ideas. So that, so they're not far away. ISIS is not far away. They're going to be right here. But why, but, would, they, but, but why would I care? I'm going to care because I want the benefits of industrial capitalism. I want to have, I want to have an extended market order that's predicated, that's predicated on the enforcement of property rights, the ability to do contracts, and the basic respect for liberty. Uh, across a wide that's geographic a, area. But that's a slice of hand. I mean, you, you, you can have all of those things and, and, and still have groups that identify as from a rebellious point of view. You just don't do business with them. I mean, but then I can't do business with them, with the individuals that deal with those groups. Right? Anyway, yeah, the, the, well, maybe but, you do do business, you choose not to. But they're going to. The thing is, if they aren't basically rights respecting, uh, they're going to be regressing, aggressing not only against possibly me, but against my uh, customers and all that. I mean, the whole vision here is of a society where I can deal with people by trade. What I want is a society where we all deal with each other by, tra by trade. That's what I think we would have to try and uh, make happen. In a, in a good idea to go to the market Okay. Um, I think we're going around um, the same circle here. Uh, it's, it's, it is the core issue. Um, 
Um, but I would like to move on now. I think the uh, sort of the point to make. Let me make one sentence, David. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. I just would say I wonder if we didn't have the United States state if we would have had ISIS or Al Qaeda. Just. <laughs> problem with the state is it prevents people from acting in their own best interest. And this is the, what twists the market. And, the, I, and I want to disabuse people of this concept of the rule of law. Okay? This is a dangerous myth which is promulgated by those in power because it serves them. It does not serve us. Okay, there's a paper by John Hosnes called The Myth of the Rule of Law. I recommend anybody look it up on online. Okay, governments do not have to obey the law. Okay, the, 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 the insane uh, Ross Ulbricht trial shows this. That judge blew through countless numbers of violations of the law. Uh, Paul, and, Paul and, and, do you have a question? Um, <laughs> I have questions. Okay, okay. I'm, just, I'm just pointing out that because I thought it was legal to make, make comments. Um, yeah, Ross Elbert trial, Edward Snowden pointed out felonies. Uh, the government doesn't have to obey the law. So when you say the rule of law, what do you, it's, it's a myth. Um, I think we all agree that it's um, improper and objectionable and bad and everything if the government isn't subject to the rule of law. I mean, that, and the whole conception really um, one of the good things in the conception of the United States is that is subjecting government to the rule of law. It, it hasn't been done perfectly, but it's one thing to say it's a myth, Paul. You can't both say it's a myth and then appeal to its violation as something disturbing and bad. I think what you want to say is it's a great principle and you'd like to see it um, applied even-handedly. Let me just make the, the comment by Hasness is one of my favorites. It's, it's a truly fantastic paper. What he points out is, uh, is that the state uses this idea of the rule of law, this myth that it, it, it is bound by it when it's really not, as a way to legitimize itself. It does similar things with democracy and with the Constitution, things like this, the so-called social contract. Um, uh, so I think that's a fantastic paper, and it's, it's just a tool the government uses to legitimize itself. As, as the result in the uh, Obamacare case yesterday showed, Statutory law, including the Constitution, is almost never objective law corresponding with property rights. So the judges have free discretion to judge, to decide however they want and then paper their reasoning. If you read the Supreme Court decision from yesterday, yeah. both sides make sense because they're both interpreting non-objective law. It's totally arbitrary. So you can't even blame the judges. They can't make a, a good decision when they're interpreting legislation or statutes. Uh, just one small comment. Um, I'm familiar with uh, Hosman's paper, and um, we will um, uh, shortly be publishing a uh, paper by uh, Jason Walker, a philosopher of law, uh, that um, preside, uh, presents a critique of that point. Uh, so anyone uh, it will uh, be uh, on our website uh, probably by the end of the year. OK, next question, I believe it's his turn. One thing I didn't hear is the power of the mind. This is really just a big mind game. Uh, government really doesn't exist. It only exists in the minds of the people who let it rule. The inner key does not, I mean, the state does not exist in my mind. It doesn't have to exist in any other mind either. What's important to me is how I relate to people. What what they do for me. That is the important thing in life. I hear all these people say, well, the anarchy happens and this happens. It, the anarchy is, is, is this in my mind. The anarchy can start tomorrow in every single one of our minds if we want it to. No one here can change my thinking and tell me there is a state unless I let them. So I'll make that point. Thank you. I get something for you. So that's something for you to take. Oh, at this moment. Yeah. I'm not sure who that was addressed to, but um, I, I would just say um, that I would think the claim that um, you have recognized that um, the government is just an idea, 
and that you refused to accept that idea, if that if you had fully reached such a realization, then um, you would ignore all the unjust laws of the United States. You would act uh, to uh, uh, confront and uh, fight any violators of what you consider to be justice. You would compete with the unjust uh, defense agency ruling all of us right now. Okay, I think <clears throat> we have time. Uh, this will have to be the last question. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, but we are out of, uh, essentially out of time. But please go ahead. Yeah, my question is addressed to the both. Um, to the what? To the what? To both. Yeah. To both of you. Um, so I, I find it very interesting that the argument uh, to justify uh, the state is the same argument people use to justify the centralization of gun ownership. If everyone walks around with a gun, everyone's going to start shooting everyone every time there's a s dispute. So let us put all the guns into the central body-making power, power, who of course will only put the guns in our enemy spaces and never our own. I think uh, Murray Rothbard said it best. The idea of a strictly limited constitutional state was a noble experiment that failed. It failed under the most favorable and propitious circumstances. So why should it fa fare any better now? Yeah. No, it's a conservative lazy fares. The man who wants to put all the guns and all the decision-making power into the hands of the central government, and then says, "Live it yourself." It is he who is truly the impractical utopian. Um, I don't have a response to that. Last, last comment. Last comment. Uh, I would just say that because competition over the use of force is what it is, it is warfare, um, and because unjust government, unjust uh, laws. Um, and criminals all um, are possible and real and actually exist, um, the right to bear arms is essential. It's essential in a free society precisely because sometimes you're going to have to fight people who are unjust. It's going to happen sometimes. And if, if we were, one of, the re, one of the things that would be nice is if our citizenry were more empowered in terms of arms than they are, uh, there would be more resistance to the bad things our government does. So it's no surprise that the unjust government we have uh, tries to take away people's guns. And that is absolutely an attack on our liberty and a vital need that we have to sustain. Thank you. We, we dodged the private ownership of nukes question, so good. <laughs> All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, a rich topic, and I really appreciate uh, uh, the interest, and um, uh, thank all of you for coming. Uh, our, the next session in our tent will be a discussion about open uh, versus closed objectivism with myself and uh, Aaron Day. So um, we'll come back in five.